Hello, French Start Dreaming for second time of the day. Very happy to be here today with all of you. And I'm going to talk for the developer keynote about the future of Salesforce development. It's a very, very vast topic. And let's get started. So first of all, thank you for all of, us, all of you joining us today. Thank you also for the sponsors for making this huge event possible. Without you, it wouldn't be the same. And now let me give you my favorite slides of all the Salesforce developer talks and Salesforce talks ever. But this is extremely important, especially in this presentation, because my whole presentation is just going to be a continuous stream of forward-looking statements. What this means is that you should make purchasing decisions based on what is commercially available in the product and not on things that may come later on in future releases. And since this presentation is about the roadmap in the future, I want to highlight the fact that a lot of the features will be landing in production in GA in the end, but some pilots may get, may get canceled, so don't start purchasing Salesforce because we never know what can happen. Things may get delayed, things may get canceled, the scope may change, so yeah. Pay attention to this, it's super important. Today, I'm here alone on stage, and I want to do a quick shout out to Alba, my colleague, who was supposed to present with me, but unfortunately, she is sick, she has the flu, so very bad fever. Unfortunately, she cannot come with us. I'm your host, I'm Philippe Ozil, I'm a developer advocate, I've been at Salesforce for about seven years now, and what I love, two things, well, code, of, of course, I'm a developer at core, but I also love the community and developer community at large. Speaking of which, what is a developer advocate? What is developer advocacy? To put it very simply, we are at your service. I'm working for developers, and I'm also working for Salesforce, and we act as an interface between you from the community and product engineering or different services in Salesforce. Our job, essentially, is to convey your feedback to the internal engineering teams, the people who are not always on the field, who may be working very hard to get features out so that you can use them in your day-to-day -day -day job. And on the other way around, our job also is to make sure that their hard work of the different engineering teams gets the light they deserve and you know about their innovation, you know about how to use them so that you can make the most out of them. So that's really what we do here. We are facilitators on both on the communication and bi-directional communication side. How do we do that? Well, you can see that we have a lot of things going on. This is just a real recap of what has been happening in a Salesforce ecosystem, especially that is, I would say, connected to developer features. A lot of them are things that we talked about during the last year. Things like menu web security, uh, UTAM for end-to-end -end testing, styling hooks, or even tools like Developer Center, Pubsub API, which I just presented earlier today. So there are a whole variety of topics that we cover and that are new in the platform. And without, without us, without you, people wouldn't know about all of this. So it's our job to educate and to create content to promote all of these things. How do we do? Well, we produce, hopefully best in class, the help of resources to do that. And we have a variety of formats in which we present those topics. The main one being our developer website. Uh, you may know this one. And what you may not know is that there are certain resource sections called developer centers, which are specific per product. So if you go and explore a bit the structure of the site, you'll find some developer centers which are specialized in certain products. So for example, there's developer center for APIs, developer center for Lightning Web Components, another one for Apex, which contains a good collection of resources. So it's always nice to explore it. It's not just the landing page here. There's a lot of other sections which are interesting. What is also connected to the website are the blog posts. My team and other contributors at Salesforce produce hundreds of blog posts per year, and we cover really a vast variety of topics. All the roadmap items I shared with you uh, earlier in the previous slides, well, there's probably at least one or two blog posts per topic there. So a good number of topics with source code, examples, links to other resources. And when not producing digital content, we're also here to support events. So first party events for us are Dreamforce and TDX, but we're also here today in Gmini events as well to help you uh, learn about the product in the Salesforce platform. Also, what we do is sometimes we contribute directly to trial content. Some of our teams, like myself, are writers for trial content. We don't do that a lot, but we help shape the message. And we also act as subject matter experts for developer content. When there are new badges, generally we are here and helping on the process of writing those new content. We are massive producers also of, of video, especially since COVID. We started doing more and more of these um, streams and on-demand videos. You may have heard of our weekly code live series that we do on uh, on YouTube, and we also produce another successful series called uh, Quick Takes, which are short format videos, like 10 minutes video explaining a technical topic. 
So these are really massive. We've done invested a lot in these, and I think they're it's a gold mine in terms of resources. Last thing we do also that I we take a lot of pride in is our sample apps. We have about 11 sample apps that we maintain. These are open source. You can find them on GitHub. I'll share some links after. Uh, these contain different set of resources showing you uh, with source code either business use cases or just samples for short recipes, short bits of code to cover one technical topic. And we cover all the recent technologies there. We cover Apex, Lightning with Components. We have functions, all of that. And there uh, there's a recipe for each of these technologies, even for migrating, for example, from Visual Force to Lightning with Components. So really check it out on uh, on GitHub. Call it's called Trailhead Apps. So that's where where we really surface all the innovation, all the best practices. These are all the different formats we work with. But now let's get back a bit uh, to the platform. So you've probably seen this uh, wheel here quite a few times already. And what this means is that we have a quite a big portfolio of different solutions. And all of these solutions are now going to be tied together with the power of Genie. Now, my specialty, as you can see from my shirt, is really the platform. I'm working on core platform. But uh, there are more and more connections between those different products. There's more integration and more synergies between them. Uh, so for example, we collaborate with Slack, with MuleSoft, and basically all around the, the wheel here. And with Genio, it's going to be really a game changer because it will basically erase the, the boundaries between the different products. You'll be able to interact seamlessly within both different products. If you look at the current state of the platform, it's really like a, a layered cake, I would say. You have Hyperforce at the bottom for scalability. You have our traditional database, which holds the metadata of your org, your records, your object types, your layouts, all of this. A bit of AI with Einstein, which helps us do predictions and the power of flows to automate a lot of actions in a declarative way. Of course, there's also all the co pro code tools as well. But this is essentially the key components of the platform today. Now, this is going to change. Thanks to the power of Genie, we're going to add another layer. And we're going to split the data layer into two parts. We're going to introduce a hyperscale data platform. It's called a data lake, which will allow us to basically duplicate data, but also scale way faster. A transactional database is super powerful, but it is not as fast as a data lake or a non-transactional database. And with the power of Genie, we'll expand a bit our data, and we'll be able to ingest sources from all the different components of the platform, but also from other sources. And then we'll apply the upper layers, AI, automation, and we'll do that in real time. So really, the, the idea here is to speed up the whole um, integration of data, the, the aggregation, and do a whole lot of different things now with uh, real time, including eventing. Not, 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 not exactly new here. Again, we, we're big pro code fans here, obviously, since we're developers. But I, it's, I want to show you this slides as a reminder, as a testament of the power of no code as well. The tool, the platform offers a lot of tools. And it's always tempting when you're a developer to go for a co pro code solution. But I want to remind you that the power of flow is and over automation is like very, very, it's very powerful. So make sure to always use the best tool for the, for the right job. And what I'm going to share in the next couple of slides is that the no code suit, go no code solutions are becoming more and more attractive, and they're allowing you to enable more productivity. There's more and more features that are becoming interesting for developers. So. That's something to keep an eye on. Having said that, let's go and look at the roadmap for flows. So this is an extract from the previous uh, release note. And you can see it's already huge. There are a lot of items. I will not go through all of them. But Salesforce is massively investing in automation. Flow is being one of the places where this surfaces. Just to give you a couple of examples, we've introduced new operators to do um, search in arrays. We've introduced. New uh, Lightning Web components, like a data table in here, which is in beta. Um, new screen flows in Slack. So we're actually conveying the messaging that we have with Genie. We're getting flows to work across the different bricks of the Salesforce platform. It's not going to be a s sorry. It's not going to be a platform first feature. It will expand beyond core platform. It will be able to use. You'll be able to use Slack as as well with flows. We also ported it, it's created a new component called Lightning Flow, which supports the creation and the interaction of flows within Lightning Web Components. And one last thing I think that's the thing that was, for me, it was really missing, was flow testing. As developers, we want to make sure that what we produce uh, can be tested and can evolve safely across releases and will not break. And that's one of the investments that I think is the most promising in terms of, um, of flow and automation. That's testing. So 
that's just what happened during the, the winter 23. You can see that's quite a lot, and there's more to come. What I'm showing you now is the roadmap. So winter 23 here, next release, spring 23, and future. Again, I want to stress out that all of this is just forward-looking statements. It's not guaranteed that everything will make it to release, not a guarantee that everything will be GA, but this is the vision of the future. I don't want to quote all the features in there because we could just spend the entire session just looking at float because we have a lot of other components that I want to talk about, but I'm going to highlight just a few things. I think one of the most and strategic things that is going to happen in the next couple of releases is in the first row here on the middle. That's the flow of the process builder migration tool. We haven't announced an end of life officially for process builder workflow and all of that, but this is going to come in several releases. And so to help you transition out of process builder, the uh, engineering teams that are working on the flow products are creating a migration tool which will help you get rid of your process builder uh, processes and migrate them to flow. So there's a huge investment in that, and if everything goes well, this new tool will be able in spring 23 release. So that's already a big uh, shift of focus. We're really trying to simplify a bit our automation, because before you may have seen that we had multiple tools which were doing a good portion uh, of the same things. Now we should focus everything on flow. Another thing that is also quite promising is um, for screen flows, it's reactive screen components. What this means is that with reactive screen components, you'll be able to have multiple components, or even in different flows, that will be able to communicate between each other. So if you have a, a screen flow in one place, it will be able to exchange information with another field on the same flow screen. And that can allow you to do, for example, dependent pick lists, things like that, which is, I think, really a game changer in terms of UX. A um, couple of other things which are also interesting, but further away, so this time I'm talking about summer and later, uh, there's, for example, the transform service, which will allow you to transform data when you're working with flows, you generally ingest a lot of data, and then we'll have some extra actions that will allow you to transform your input data and change format. Another feature I think that was requested a lot by, uh, I would say, less technical uh, users is the uh, no-code HTTP action. So we'll be able to do callouts with uh, flow actions directly from a flow. So that's part of the things we're working on. Again, flow is going to be part of the automation layer, but it's going to be spreading across the platform. There is going to be support for flows, or actually orchestrators in OmniScript, so it will be beyond just the core platform. And we're going to add also orchestration to Slack. So you see it's going to it's going to be a lot of flows, but a lot of flows just not on the Salesforce platform, above and around the Salesforce platform. Same thing for MuleSoft. MuleSoft will be able to integrate more easily with flows because we're going to simplify the authentication mechanism that allows you to do uh, callouts to flows and also starting flows from MuleSoft. So huge investment on, on the flow side of things. Uh, there's a lot of unknown here because obviously <laughs> it depends on a number of, of factors, but that's the direction the flow team is going to. So that was the, the part about flow. Now I want to talk to you about Lightning Web Components, which is also another focus uh, for engineering teams. There are a lot of things going on with, with Lightning Web Components, and I'm going to spend a bit more time now highlighting a couple of these things uh, from a very technical standpoint, because some of these things are really right next to the corner. The first thing I want to show you is Light DOM. I don't know if some of you are familiar with this. This is already beta right now as we speak. Lightdom is a way to open uh, the, mm, the DOM. When you create Lightning Web Components, the principle that drives Web Components is encapsulation. So each component is sealed and cannot, I would say, um, inherit from upper uh, dependencies. So same, this applies for the, um, the DOM, the, the objects that are in the tree for a component, but also the styling, all sorts of things like this. Now, this principle is very efficient for creating uh, robust components that can be reused. However, it creates another problem. When you, want to, um, when you want to share style across components, when you want to access components that are deep inside a page, you cannot do that because the Shadow DOM will prevent you from doing this. With Light DOM, we open the door to accessing certain elements on the, on the DOM tree. And you can see this materializes with two things. First of all, there's a static property declared in the Lightning Web Components class, uh, render mode equals light, and then there's also a attribute on the template for the parent component. And after that, everything that is under this parent component becomes open in light DOM. This means that you can share style down, so if you have a parent style sheet, it will leak down and cascade down, sorry, 
and the child components. You'll be able to work with third party components, and that's actually one of the key drivers of this initiative is being able to explore the content of sub components so that you can use things like Google Tag Manager to track user interactions or even use other libraries in a more scalable way. And accessibility also is another dri driver um, because the boundaries of Shadow DOM was sometimes preventing complex components from being more accessible. So that's one of the on the things that are coming up. Another thing uh, that is, I think, very, very in demand is the Refresh View API. That's been a, uh, a, a an adoption uh, problem with Aura. When you have a, um, a, a record page with components and you want to change some of these component values or record values, this causes an issue because you need to refresh the page. And in certain cases, you cannot do so with pure Lightning Web components. So to do that, we rely on a port or hack with Aura that had support for such an event. Now we're taking this, the concept of being able to trigger a page refresh to Lightning Web Components thanks to this new pilot in Winter 23. And you can see it's very simple to use. You just need to import a new refresh event and you'll dispatch it just any, like any other type of event. This will allow you to refresh a page and reload some values from a programmatic way. So it doesn't seem like much, but it's one of the last things that prevented you from migrating from Aura. So it's good that we lift the barriers so that we can close the door on the Aura chapter. Another thing I think which people will like is uh, the new conditional directives. Um, the Lightning Web Components team has been working a bit with this for some time already. And this is going to be GA very soon in spring. And it allows you to make uh, your templates even simpler. Before privacy, you're, you're, you were able to do this, but you had to chain if and if conditions. And now we're, we're introducing a new else and else if logic so that you can do things like routing or conditional statements in a more, much more compact way. You'll notice that we haven't kept the original syntax. The syntax is a bit different. Pre previously, it was if false, if true. And now we're using LWC prefix. So LWC if, LWC else if, and LWC else. So there's a bit of renaming. Uh, we'll create content and probably some tools to help you migrate to this new structure. But in the end, it's going to mean cleaner code and um, more powerful templates. Another thing that I want to highlight, and I think this is one is a bit more controversial, it's the support for uh, expressions within templates. So this one will surface in summer if everything goes well. I have, I would say, I would say this is really much of a forward-looking statement because there's a lot of challenges behind this one. In Aura, you had the ability to do that. You were able to create expressions. So it's not as powerful as pure JavaScript, but you had the ability to do a bit of compute uh, directly within those curly braces. And this is going to be landing in Lightning Web Components. You'll have the ability to do that. But there are still a number of unknowns, like how do you test this? Because you cannot control directly the content of the expressions. And how will it, how it, will, how it, will it coexist with uh, existing web standards? Because obviously, this is not exactly standard. So I think that's an interesting direction, but there's still a lot of unknowns on how this will be implemented and, and whether it will be available for everyone. But it's one of the uh, important topics that the Lightning Web Components team is working on. Um, very quickly, another one that is also interesting is that we're going to be expanding the support for native uh, custom elements, so native web components from other frameworks into Lightning Web Components. Before uh, this feature, it was kind of hard to work with third-party libraries. So if you have, for example, a React component, but you wanted to bring in your Lightning Web Components, you had to hack a bit. It was a bit difficult, although both of them were pure web components, but you could, you could not really mix them. Now, there's a new directive. You can see here LWC external, which will declare the native component as a Lightning Web Component supported web component. So this will allow us to mix uh, components from various libraries and expand a bit the, um, the number of web components that you can ha have access to. Again, this is scheduled for summer 23, but I think there are also a lot of, uh, lot of work still to be done on this. Sum it up uh, regarding Lightweb like, components, um, just the key highlights. The, the main one is being the, oops, sorry, is the refresh API beta, looking forward to spring 23, the new template, which should go directly GA, there's, there won't be any, um, there won't be any uh, beta or pilot that's going to go directly GA. The templating is pretty easy. And then further down the road, the template expressions, I think, are going to be also a game changer because it will heavily impact the way we write Lightning Web Components. So stay tuned for those. Um, probably, yeah, <laughs> we'll create a lot of content to support this as soon as we know more. Switching now to Apex. 
Trapex, there are also a lot of work being, on, being done. I'm just gonna highlight a key few things. The first one is already um, in developer preview as we speak. It's called Daily Weave in, in Apex. Daily Weave is coming from the um, Microsoft ecosystem. It's a functional programming language that allows you to transform data from one source to another, or even the same source, but remap certain things. This is working in three stages. There's a read part, a transform part, and a write. And Data Weave is really in the middle, helping the transform side of things. So let me show you how this works in practice. So all it takes in practice is a couple of lines of Apex you can see up there, and it will take you a format from one type of data to another. Here I'm showing you a very basic example how you would transform CSV into JSON. Now if you try to do this in Apex, you'll notice that there's no parser for CSV. It seems like a pretty simple format, just comma separated, but what happens when you start having commas in your values, for example? Like here we have a comma in the value. Where What happens when you have line breaks in your values? So writing a CSV parser is not something trivial, and you don't want to do that in Apex. So the good news is that you won't have to do it an, at all, because you'll be able to leverage the power of data weave to do that. In this simple example, we've taken a, a CSV input here. We've wrote a data weave script. So this is going to be a new metadata type, a d dot dwl metadata type. And what it does is that it specifies the input format as application CSV, specifies an output format as application JSON, and just takes the content that it needs to translate. And then in the end, you get your JSON output, as simple as that. So this is really the basics here. It's, it's like a very simple thing, but it can get more advanced. You're, you have the ability to do things like transformation or mapping of fields. Like for example, if you were not happy with the, the format of your input fields here, you could map those out to a record. So instead of outputting application JSON, you could output, for example, a contact record. You have the ability to rename the field, to remap them, and it's actually very powerful. This is really a basic example. I'm just taking the payload and applying a transformation on it. But you can do way more than that when you learn the data weave syntax. And it will be very simple to use from Apex because from Apex standpoint, it's just loading the script here with the name of the script, which is matching to the metadata type, executing it, providing your inputs. So here there's only one input, which is the original payload containing the CSV file. And getting the result here is just a string in this case, but it could be like a, a record if you were mapping to a SAS record. So I think this is quite promising. Developer preview right now, and it's going to move forward as we move. So that's really the one of the key things that are coming up. Um, the, um, the target for uh, GA for data with is summer or later. It will depend, depending on how much we scale. But I think what I want to stress out is that data with for now is being expanded to Apex, but it's going to be probably expanding even further. Uh, the Microsoft team is looking at open sourcing the um, data weave uh, engine. So you'll be able to use it in Java or any other technologies so that it's not going to be something that is going to be strictly limited to the platform, but it could be other applications in other fields. So a lot of other things are going on. In Spring, there's going to be another thing which, which is already um, in developer pre or beta. I can't remember exactly. That's, oh, beta, sorry, in beta. That's called user mode. When you work with uh, Apex in data, uh, there's a little problem. When you're working with data, you don't necessarily apply the right uh, permissions when you do uh, queries and when you do operations. With user mode GA, you'll be able to enforce access rights when you write operations on records. So that's something that is important from a security standpoint. And you'll be able maybe to call out other users to operate on behalf of other users. Further down, like really further down, not, not further even later maybe, there is something called generics that is also on the roadmap. If you've been doing Java, you probably know about generics, and you are actually are using generic in nowadays in Apex. Generics are a way to pass a parameter to a class. So whenever you're using a list, a map, or a set, you, you may know that on the syntax side of things, you have curly uh, brackets, and you pass in another type. So list of objects, like list of contact, it's all list, brackets, uh, contact, and brackets. So this is a generic type. You can use generic types for collections. You can also use them for, for iterators. But you cannot create your own generic class. So you cannot create uh, my class as a generic of objects, or like contact, for example. With support of generics, it will allow you to build a class that can take uh, any kind of type and run these operations on this type. So you could build your own iterator or your own object that will do some work on another third-party object. This is going to be very interesting in terms of decoupling because you're going to be able to, to pass types that are not hard-coded in your generic class. So 
I mean, it's it's kind of hard to give you an example of right now without going further into this. But if it op if it works, it'll be a game changer. It was really a revolution when it was introduced in Java, and I have high hopes that it will be able to get it also for Apex. But again, I want to stress out the fact that it's kind of far on the roadmap, so still hoping for this. But again, this is a forward-looking statement. That's the future for Apex. Now I'm going to go on to the next uh, set of things, things that we use on our day-to-day -day work, developer tooling. We use a lot of developer tools in our day-to-day -day work, and I want to give you a little tour of the landscape of what's coming up in terms of tooling. So essentially, this is grouped in a number of categories, and the idea is to give you the best tools that you can do development and DevOps as easily as possible and as fast as possible. To do that, we're focusing on a number of areas. First of all, we want to make sure that you have fast test environments. You're going to be able to spin up sandboxes which way faster than before. And we're going to leverage Hyperforce to do that. So I'll explain that in the next couple of slides. We want also to make sure that more and more people are involved in the DevOps process. Up till now, DevOps was really a matter of engineers, people who had a deep knowledge of code. But with new tools like DevOps Center, we want to democratize this a bit so that business users are more involved in the cycle of DevOps, or non-technical users can also participate in the DevOps process. We're also working on modern tooling with our partnership with AWS. We have now a new feature called Code Builder that I will present, which allows you to basically do the same thing as VS Code, but within the comfort of your browser. We're also opening uh, our ecosystem to support additional languages. There's going to be more on that when we go to functions. And we're also supporting more and more integrations with uh, third-party software, for third-party developer tools. So starting with environments. The next innovation that we're going to do uh, in terms of, um, of sandboxes is leveraging really hyperforce to create more, um, more scalable and faster sandboxes. And this is, there are two operations here that are really key here. The first one is clone. When you when you work with a uh, large set of data, you know how painful it can be to, to clone in a sandbox. It can take days, it can take hours, and that's something that is a bit of a bottleneck when you want to do proper CI or even continuous development because it takes a lot of time to refresh those sandboxes and to create them. Now, because we have the, the flexibility of hyperforce, we're going to be able to speed up significantly the time it takes to clone a sandbox. Because uh, the database and the infrastructure is more lightweight, it will allow us to go faster and be able to, to do CI much faster and also user accent testing, training, all of that. This is already started. So right now, you can do this with uh, developer and developer pro sandboxes, which is their individual development environment. But later on, I think well, the real power will be is that we'll be able to do the same thing, but for full sandboxes. So you'll be able to create a full sandbox in a matter of minutes compared to days or hours. And that's scheduled for very soon because it's going to be happening in a Spring 23 release. Another thing that will happen also more in the same timeline is like we're going to be able to create full sandboxes from scratch also very quickly starting from Spring 23. There's going to be a limited pilot to do that. And it also relies on the power of Hyperforce to be able to spin up these orgs very quickly. Now, there's going to be also another thing also on in the uh, sandbox ecosystem. It is called the scale sandbox. Some of you may already have to try to do this before. Uh, we typically discourage you from doing this. Don't do performance testing on real orgs. You may have heard that this causes issues because we're a multi-tenant environment, so this will affect other tenant, other customers on the same org, on the same instance. So to compensate for that, because we don't, we want people to be able to do performance testing. It's important to be able to simulate a full user load. We're going to be doing a new introducing a new sandbox, which will be self-service. It's going to be called Scale Sandbox. And you'll be able to request those sandbox self-service without going through support, which is normally what you would have to do to request a specific window for performance testing. You'll be able to spin up those sa scale sandboxes, run your full tests, and be able to get diagnostic very quickly without any uh, man in the middle like support. That's, I think, it's a really good, good thing, because that was kind of, um, of the problem of the um, of the fact that you had to um, to request a permission and get only a specific window for running your performance test. Now it's going to be performing tests anytime you want, but on specific orgs. With that, you'll be able to diagnose problems way faster and like before they arise in production. So you'll be able to test SLAs, you'll be able to test limits without impacting other customers because you'll be running in a scale sandbox which is isolated from the other tenants of your instance. 
Spring 23, that's the target for the pilot. Uh, I'm sure there are a lot of things to, to solve to make it really GA, but that's really going in the right direction. Something else that is actually way closer to us in terms of roadmap, that's DevOps Center. DevOps Center is already here, and it's not exactly GA yet because it's not purely tied to the Winter 23 release, but it will be released GA this month. I don't have the exact date, but in coming weeks, we'll be GAing this. And for those of you who don't know yet about uh, Developer Center, the DevOps Center, sorry, the main focus here is to leverage the modern tooling, but also make it accessible for non-technical users, meaning that you will have a user interface which will help you deploy your and track your changes all around the um, deployment lifecycle, moving from your individual sandboxes to maybe full sandboxes, UAT, and production. The way it works is that DevOps Center is tied to GitHub, so you will create branches with your changes and you'll be able to move from one, envir one environment to another uh, with a series of clicks so without code. And you'll be able to merge those changes, integrate them with other changes that work, collaborate within a team of developers, all of that from the comfort of a Salesforce org and the DevOps Center, just with clicks. Now, of course, we're aware that developers do not necessarily want to use full UI tools, so this is also compatible with uh, your traditional tools, like you can work with Visual Studio Code, you can work with the CLI, there's gonna be an extension to the CLI which will let you control the DevOps Center from a programmatic standpoint. So this is not going GA, the CLI is not going GA in December, but the teams are already working on this. In the future releases, you'll be able to control the DevOps Center from a programmatic approach using the CLI, and you'll be able to script certain actions from the DevOps Center with a CLI. Not only that, but you'll be able to connect the DevOps Center with your original uh, CI systems. What DevOps Center does not do right now is CI. This is a bit disconnected for now from the traditional CI process, but with this new CLI, we'll be able to integrate closer um, to what is, I would say, DevOps as we perceive it as developers. So more on that later on. Another thing that is also happening in terms of uh, novelties uh, for day-to-day -day work is the uh, Visual Studio Code off browser. Uh, just like we have multiple environments uh, in DevOps Center, you, we work with tens of different orgs in our day-to-day -day job, and it's always been a, tr a struggle. I don't know about you, but I generally have 50, 100 orgs, and I don't remember which one is which one. With the off browser, we'll be able to create categories and sort our different orgs into categories so that we can keep track of what our scratch orgs, what our sandboxes, what our production integration, UAT, whatever you name it, and sort them out really nicely so that we can remember where which, which org is where. And we'll also be able to track expired orgs from directly from Visual Studio Code without having to run any scripts. Another thing that is coming up, and it's already on open beta, so you can try it right now for my devog, is the Code Builder. Code Builder is essentially uh, your Visual Studio Code, but with running within a browser. Thanks to our partnership with AWS, we're able to create a full environment with the Salesforce extensions, with the terminal, in a browser and it's, it's going very fast. I know that there were some demos at Dreamforce, of, or no, sorry, it was another Dreaming event, so people were even able to try this out on a tablet. So you can really take your ID anywhere on the road, and it's, it's great because you can do everything now fully cloud-based. So that's another way of editing uh, software working from a browser. Now, to recap a bit everything that touches on developer tools, Code Builder is going to be GA in spring, so we're almost there. There's going to be some development uh, in terms of DevOps Center. So first of all, the CI, CLI may be coming in spring. I haven't written down the CLI part on, on this side here. It's going to be either in spring or a bit later, but we are working on the CLI to control the DevOps Center. But what is coming also is the opening of DevOps Center to other ecosystems. DevOps Center at this point of time only works with GitHub. So that's kind of a limiting factor. If your code is on another Git provider, you cannot use DevOps Center. But in the future, we want to open DevOps Center to work with other Git providers. So you'll be able to use DevOps Center with Bitbucket, GitLabs, and other uh, sources that can host um, source uh, host sorry uh, source control. Not only that, we want to also uh, expand a bit the um, the um, the work item uh, manager. Right now, uh, when you create a new content, like a new release or a new feature, it it creates a work item that you move on in some sort of Kanban board on the DevOps Center. These works items are purely tracked in the Salesforce org, but we want to open the ability to have those work items surfaced in another system. And one of these solutions exploring is Jira. 
So you may be familiar with Jira, it's a tool that lets you track work items pretty much like you could track work items in Salesforce. So we want to be able to integrate DevOps Center with other uh, ticketing systems like Jira. Um, one last thing coming up soon, oh, soon, in a couple of releases are the scale sandbox. So right now it's a bit further down the road, hoping for summer, but we'll, we'll see. Um, again, this is supported by our new hyperscale infrastructure, so that is really something that will speed up and ease DevOps processes in general. Now, moving to another topic, also close to my heart, Heroquin functions. You may have heard in the past that there's been a lot of changes in the Heroku ecosystem. Uh, we are opening a new chapter here, and the, the reasoning behind this is that we want to revisit the architecture of Heroku. What you did not see as a Heroku user is that it's an incredibly complex infrastructure that scales, but we want to take it even further. So to do that, we need to refocus on mission-critical uh, services. So we want to reduce essentially the number of of um, instances so that we can just scale them up and fa faster. And to do that, we are going to do another thing. We're going to also work on increasing the portfolio consistency. What do I mean by that is that we are going to make sure that um, uh, sorry that um, Heroku is not a standalone brick in our customer 360 wheel. We want to make sure that it has more interactable interactions with the other um, Salesforce clouds. So we're going to do a number of things. Like we already started with Salesforce Functions, but now um, integrations with Salesforce Data and Heroku Data. But we're gonna also going to continue down erasing the limits and the borders between the different uh, clouds. Finally, uh, we're also working on unifying the Heroku developer experience with the rest of the Salesforce developer experience. And this has been going for a couple of releases now. You may have seen the SFCLI tool, which is now replacing the old, good old SFDX command line. And this is part of what we do. We, we're going to expand this to also support Heroku and also functions, all of this with a unified developer experience. I mentioned this, so part of the reason why we're, we're trying to work with uh, more consistency is that we want to make it even easier to mix and match different offerings from the Salesforce ecosystem. Heroku and functions are going to play more nicely together now because we're opening the door to exposing Salesforce, uh, sorry, Heroku data to Salesforce functions. You'll be able to create Postgres databases, Redis databases, and even Kafka, and use them from the comfort of functions. And these are going to be exposed in, um, in a very accessible way. When you call a function, you'll be able to call those seamlessly without having to re-authenticate, without having to configure th them. They'll be already um, transparently attached. Not only this, but we'll also make sure that the, um, the all the caching, all of that makes it like a very a prime partner to, to work with. The Heroku team also is working on scaling, scaling up operations. Heroku instances are maybe not as big as what you could have if you were working for AWS, but we're opening now the door for more elastic databases. If you were already working with uh, Postgres dynos on Heroku, uh, you, have, you had to basically choose a, a certain dyno type or add-on type to work with a specific size of database. But once your database grew too much, you needed to migrate to a more powerful uh, class of database. Now, with the new Elastic Pro Postgres service, you'll be able to scale automatically to a bigger database size. And that's super important because now that we have access to functions, we're going to be able to uh, up upload and, uplo um, and download a lot of data in those databases. So we need more elasticity to support the functions. And this is part of simplifying the process for um, developers working on Heroku. Another thing that we're working on is the ability to connect Dynos and Salesforce data. There's already at this point the um, Heroku Connect and Salesforce Connect tools, which are not exactly new, but we're now going to have more and more interac interactions between the two. And uh, the teams are working on, so this is future, it's not even summer, it's further down the way on the, on the roadmap, they're working on exploring certain uh, wire adapters which would let you connect to Heroku data directly from the Salesforce user interface. So you'd be able to query Heroku data from the comfort of a Lightning Web Components running on a Salesforce org. Interoperability with functions and integrate with the customer 360 means that you will be able to access data from other clouds also in a much more convenient way. Summing it up, um, we already were past the summer release. Uh, sorry, we're 
going for the spring release. Uh, there will be also new regions for Heroku. Right now, there's only two regions available for Heroku, so this can be a problem. There's only Europe and the US. And we're working on adding extra regions. So whenever you're working in some places which are further away from the data centers, we'll have support for additional regions. Game changer for functions is like we're going to have the Python language supported, so we'll be able to write functions with the Python language in Spring. Uh, uh, we'll be sh we'll there's going to be a couple of resources coming up in the Sassel's blog in the next couple of weeks. You'll see the power of Python in functions. And further down the road, uh, more work on compliance. So something called Heroku SBOM is coming up, software bill of material. This is extremely important for large organizations which need uh, governance. And what it means essentially is that larger organizations need to track dependencies. And they need to track dependencies for security pers perspective, for licensing perspective. And so with Heroku as bomb, they are going to be able to get some reporting and insights on the dependencies that the Heroku apps are bringing. So if you have, like, for example, um, dependencies on sensitive um, libraries, for example, libraries that have been exposed to Severity Zero issues, you'll be able to draw in some reportings. You'll be able to prevent also deployments of outdated libraries in Heroku deployments at scale. This is part of SBOM. Same thing for licensing. If you, you can prevent uh, certain types of libraries from being integrated in your course, in your source code, because this could be uh, using a li um, some sort of license that is um, meaning that you have to open source your entire co code base. Uh, it's, um, I forgot the name of the license. Sorry, I'm having a blank here. GPL, thank you. Yes. So these kind of things. Don't don't work well in proprietary code, so you can put in some flags with Heroku as bound that will prevent deployment of such libraries, so that you can detect issues early before being in production, having like huge governance issues. And further down the road, also another thing that is going to be uh, coming to functions is functions user mode. Right now, functions work operate in a, um, in a separate um, security context compared to your regular users. And with your functions user mode, you'll be able to, to select the current user running a function and apply the same permissions to the function's runtime environment. So that's going to be very interesting because it's very challenging to do at the moment. If you want to learn more about the functions in Heroku uh, roadmap, the teams have already shared these roadmaps on their GitHub repository. Uh, this is something that you may want to look at. Uh, I will share another resource I think is probably even more helpful summing up all the different roadmaps of the different features that I've shared today. We still have two more things to cover before we finish. First, I want to talk about um, the PubSub API. I presented this earlier on today, so I'm not going to spend too much time on this. But what is coming up is that we're going to be using more and more the PubSub API, and we're going to be using it to support Genie. What it means is that you're going to be able to use PubSub API to do ingress, so bringing data to Genie, so that you can transform this data and aggregate it across multiple clouds, and also egress, so making uh, real-time uh, operations based on events coming out of the Genie platform. PubSub API works from with within the comfort of Salesforce, but also is available uh, with MuleSoft, where uh, PubSub API's connectors for publishing and subscribing to uh, PubSub API within MuleSoft. Another thing that the API team has been working on, and I think it's pretty new and it's also a game changer, is the GraphQL API. This is a new type of API that works a bit differently from your traditional REST APIs. It allows you essentially to request multiple objects and to select exactly the format of those objects that you're receiving uh, from the request format. So here I have a little example. You're requesting an account. You can provide a filter, and then you select the kind of fields you want. So this is a simple, simple request with just an account. But what's interesting with this query is that you could add other types. So you could be fetching sub-objects. You can bring the contacts of the account. You can bring some other related objects directly from a single request. And you don't need to do run multiple requests. You'll be able to select exactly the fields you want, and you can also run some aggregation operations within the request. The idea behind this, for now, it's only read-only. But the idea of this is that you'll be able to write fewer requests to interact with the Salesforce APIs. And you'll be able to query multiple objects aggregate and inspect the structure of those objects with a couple of API calls. This is really dedicated to building user interfaces, and it will progressively be enabled in Lightning Web Components. So soon you'll see that you'll be able to use new Lightning Web Component wires so that you can run GraphQL API calls on the back end. So you'll be able, in your browser, to specify the data that you want to retrieve, and you won't have to worry about running multiple requests. You'll be able to aggregate all of this into a single GraphQL query so that you have exactly the data for the right format of your views directly from Lightning Web Components. 
Now we bring a lot of new features in APIs, but we also are retiring some some older APIs. We already did this exercise last summer, and there's a new batch of API, legacy API retirement coming up. In summer, we'll be retiring API version 21 through 30. And so you'll have to be careful because you'll have to look at your, at your logs and you'll have to remove and update both APIs. These are all the APIs uh, that are derived from the REST endpoint, starting with stash service data and then the version. And it covers a lot of different types of APIs. We have already have shared some resources on how to identify uh, the, um, the affected API calls. Essentially, you'll have to scan your logs, and there are some tools that can help you do that, like a nice CLI tool that is dedicated to this. Looking at the roadmap, um, what's coming up really is um, the fact that we'll have um, more, more investment in the bulk API, so we'll have better support for large-scale data ingestion and large-scale data modifications. We also have uh, some investment in terms of uh, um, pubs of API. For example, the published callback is going to come up very soon. So we have the ability to notify uh, pubs of API publishers that the messages have been indeed published by the bus. So it's adding extra security to publication. And further down the road, um, we're going to have access to something called so-called nested queries. And this is going to be very powerful. You're going to have sub-queries in, in certain uh, parent so-called queries, so you'll be able to search for multiple types of record with mixed uh, record types and object types, sorry. More work on the open API schemas coming up also. Um, you'll be able to generate a uh, schema descriptor for your APIs so that you can use third-party clients to generate uh, clients for the Celsius APIs just using a schema. Last part of this presentation, and then uh, I'm done with all the novelties. There's quite a lot, sorry for that our AWS partnership. With Hyperscale, we're, we're partnering more and more uh, with, the, uh, with AWS, and we have a, lo a lot of different touch points. One of them uh, that I think is key for developers is unified developer experience. There are a lot of other things. I will not cover everything here, but we have more and more connections with them. And one of the things we do with them is making sure that it's now easier than ever to integrate with an AWS environment. Previously, you would have to re-authenticate. You would have to build some bridges between your Salesforce ecosystem, uh, your Salesforce environment, and your AWS environment. But the teams at Salesforce and AWS are making things simpler for you. They're unifying the developer experience of both platforms. So this comes in a number of uh, operations. So first, we're going to be doing data services, which will let you access AWS data seamlessly from the comfort of Salesforce. And you'll be able also to connect with um, AWS eventing systems from um, Salesforce in a transparent way. So you'll be using the same PubSub API, passing it out to the AWS eventing system, and also receiving AWS events using your PubSub API as well. So very quickly, just to summarize the key things that are going, up and going on. First of all, there's the authentication uh, bridges for AWS. Right now, AWS supports different credentials than Salesforce, so we're going to bring a number of tools to simplify the authentication when you have to access a DBS service. It already started with name credentials for basic uh, Amazon services, and it's going to go further with IAM roles. So this is basically a set of permissions, but on the uh, AWS ecosystem. So you'll be able to, to prepare your operations and manage credentials in a centralized and secure way. More, uh, more also more interaction in terms of APIs. There is going to be a GraphQL adapter which will let you fetch AWS data from Salesforce APIs, so that you don't have to deal with authentication. It's coming up in Pilot in Spring, and will really unlock the power of uh, AWS for bringing data in. And the other thing is event relays. Event relay is the bridge that lets you connect Salesforce Event Bus to the AWS Event Bridge. So that's their own event bus. And with Event Relay, we, we allow you to do uh, bi-directional communication between the two buses. So Salesforce events, like platform events, change data capture will be transformed automatically into Amazon events and vice versa. Amazon could be able to push some events on their infrastructure back to Salesforce, pub, sub, uh, sorry, Salesforce event bus. This is everything that is going on. I mean, that is a lot. I understand that it was uh, quite intense for people who are new to the platform. Um, I talked a lot, but if you want to get a single thing out today is remember this URL here. This is the um, a link on the Architect website, which summarized a lot of these innovations. The Architect team is building an incredible 
uh, platform roadmap component on their website, which will track all of these innovations, and will, you'll be able to, to basically revisit this site on a day-to-day -day basis to watch what is coming up in the next couple of releases. After that, if you want to connect with us, these are our different social handles, our website. Uh, we're active on uh, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube, where you can find a lot of videos for the topics that I already presented today. With that, I want to thank you again, and thanks all the sponsors. Thank you.